Uh, a very good morning to all. Uh, today's topic will be on antenatal diagnosis of various surgical conditions and parental counseling. So, as an overview, uh, we will be discussing regarding the uh, various options in uh, fetal medicine and about uh, prenatal screening and also various prenatal diagnostic options. Then we'll come to then we'll come to uh, very specific surgical conditions which can be diagnosed prenatally and uh, uh, the, regarding the management of the particular uh, surgical conditions it will be dealt in another class uh, of uh, fetal medicine and fetal surgery uh, we'll just discuss regarding the uh, diagnostic options and also screening and most importantly regarding how to counsel the patients uh, patients uh, bystanders regarding the surgical conditions and uh, what all options we can give to them So, uh, fetal medicine and perinatology, we know that it is an emerging subspecialty of uh, obstetrics and also pediatric surgery. Uh, and uh, the congenital malformations accounts for almost 2 to 4 percent of live births. Uh, but in Indian population, uh, the congenital malformations comes around 4 to 7 percent. So, it is very important that we identify these malformations early and uh, provide a, a proper intervention at the right time. Uh, fetal malformations also account for almost 30 percent of the perinatal deaths so it is very uh, very uh, it's significant that we identify the malformations at an early date rather than uh, finding the malformations after uh, once the baby is delivered because it leads to long-term disabilities and it has a uh, huge impact on the individual assets that is the parents and on the family the healthcare system and also on the society so antenatal diagnosis helps in reduction of the maternal and also perinatal morbidity, mortality and also disability. Uh, the main idea is that it offers a targeted and timely management option including pregnancy termination or uh, if it is amenable for fetal intervention then that has, to, that has to be done at the right time to get the uh, maximum effect. So <clears throat> the basic components are mainly prenatal screening and also prenatal diagnosis. Prenatal screening plays a major role because uh, that is a stepping stone towards identifying the various uh, congenital anomalies. So I will just have a few words. I uh, will discuss regarding a few things regarding prenatal screening first. Then we will go to the diagnostic modalities. The prenatal sc screening tools mainly involves uh, various uh, blood parameters like uh, beta HCG level, then pregnancy associated plasma protein A level, uh, the ultrasound screening and also quadruple screen tests. I will come into the details of uh, uh, each uh, screening parameter later. <coughs> the prenatal diagnosis uh, part mainly involves uh, prenatal imaging that is mainly ultrasound is a mainstay of uh, imaging uh, fetal imaging. Then comes the role of MRI and also in, these are non-invasive uh, diagnostic modalities and when we come to invasive diagnostic modalities it involves chorionic villus sampling, amniocentesis, chordocentesis for uh, uh, taking blood of the fetus for uh, various analysis and also placental biopsy and, and placental biopsy. Now coming to uh, the part of genetic screening. The main goal of genetic screening is to detect or to define the risk in a normal population uh, regarding uh, various uh, chromosomal abnormalities or genetic conditions. So it is just to define the risk in the asymptomatic low risk population. Uh, main, main screening is main, screening is mainly done to detect either single gene defects or to identify chromosomal anomalies. Chromosomal anomalies can be either structural or a, a numerical anomaly like uh, trisomies uh, of uh, 21, 18 or 13 and also structural anomalies of chromosome. And gene defects mainly it is targeted towards screening heterozygotes as if uh, if the mother or a father is a carrier uh, if both the parents are a carrier then there is high chance for the child developing the same disease and child will be uh, child will be presenting with the disease so in that case we will have to screen them for the specific gene defects and it is mainly indicated for medical conditions like hemoglobinopathies and cystic fibrosis canavan disease etc now coming to chromosome anomalies, <clears throat> it accounts for uh, less than 1% of the newborns. Uh, it's seen in less than 1% of the newborns. And uh, the main chromosome anomaly which we come across is the Down syndrome. And the incidence is around 1 in 800 to 1000 live births. So the main uh, thing which we need to know is that <clears throat> the risk of the Downs increases with the maternal age. And uh, irrespective of the maternal age, we have to offer aneuploidy screening for all the mothers in all the age group to pick up uh, such diseases <clears throat> and also uh, when we consider the maternal age uh, when the maternal age is below 30 years of age the incidence is uh, 
uh, less but once it climbs above that is above 30 years uh, the incidence increases like uh, it will be initially it is around 1, 1 in 800 to 1000 live births that is a normal incidence of downs but once uh, maternal age increases around it, if it becomes around uh, 35 years of age then the uh, incidence is almost around 1 in 400 live births and once uh, maternal age is around 40 years it is almost reaching 1 in 100 live births so uh, screening is mandatory now uh, the, welcome to the first trimester screening <clears throat> this is uh, actually offered to all uh, mothers in first trimester itself so as to identify the anomalies at an early age so that adequate measures can be taken or further diagnosis can be done on the same so the first trimester screening is ma uh, mainly involves the double marker test double marker is two markers are used that is one is beta hcg and the other one is pregnancy associated plasma protein a and the timing of this test is uh, at around 11 to 13 weeks 13 weeks plus or minus six days you can take so it is uh, done at an average of around 11 to 13 weeks time and it is done to identify mainly the trisomies <coughs> So in uh, trisomy 21, what finding we will get is that the beta HCG level will be high and the PAPA level will be low. And in trisomies of 13 and 18, both the beta HCG and the PAPA levels will be low. So if this finding is seen, then we will do further uh, invasive testing or karyotyping to confirm the same. This is just a screening test, not a confirmatory test. And uh, in order to increase the sensitivity, we have all, uh, along with this double marker, other parameters are also included. That is, uh, at 11 to 13 weeks of time, uh, we will be doing a ultrasound. Presently, it is uh, mentioned that uh, it should be done by a, a fetal medicine or a perinatology uh, specialist, so that proper uh, there is a universal standard for the same. So the components include maternal age, considering maternal age, the double markers, and the nuchal transfers. Trans, translucency at the at a crown from length of 45 to 84 centimeters so what do you mean by nuchal translucency is that uh, the nuchal translucency is an area of uh, fluid collection which is seen on ultrasound behind the neck region of the fetus so increase in nuchal translucency is significant ideally uh, more than 90 if it comes above the 95th percentage it is very significant and it suggests that uh, the child has high risk for developing or it is having a trisomy or other structural anomalies chances also very high the sensitivity of this test comes around more than 90 percent then uh, there are also some other time uh, first trimester markers which we see in ultrasound which can be added along with this test to increase the sensitivity so other markers include the appearance of the na nasal bone the blood flow across the tricuspid valve if it can be made out in ultrasound at that time then the fetal heart rate the ductus venosus flow so i thought uh, initially i spoke about the sensitivity that it has more than 90 percent so once you add on all these extra findings it increases the sensitivity by five percent now coming to the screening uh, in second trimester because uh, some people may not have access to any screening parameters or will not be aware of the same during first trimester and with second trimester anomalies can during that time they will be doing screening so in that case uh, there are two major screening tests one is a triple marker test and the other one is a quadruple test triple marker is also like similar to that uh, first trimester uh, screening test it involves beta hcg but other uh, parameters include maternal serum alpha fetoprotein and unconjugated estriol then comes the quadruple test so quadruple test is actually triple test plus you add inhibin a also along with it and uh, both these screening tests helps in detection of uh, trisomies 21 and 18 and also neural tube defects because in case of uh, open neural tube defects the serum alpha fetoprotein level also goes up so that is indirectly saying that uh, there is a chance for a neural tube defect and uh, this uh, uh, usually the second trimester screening is done at around 15 to 20 weeks time so that uh, it early anomaly can be picked up and uh, necessary intervention can be done if at all we need to terminate the pregnancy it can be done before 20 weeks then uh, the sensitivity of triple test will come only around 69 percent so so mostly it is not done so uh, the quadruple test is preferred because it has a, a more sensitivity and it comes around 80 to 85 percent now how do you properly screen the child uh, uh, screen the mother is that uh, you can either do a combined screening that is first trimester plus second trimester so it has got uh, two modalities one is an integrated test you do both the screening at when you get the patient at the first time itself or you can do a sequential screening sequential screening means you do the uh, first trimester screening in the first trimester then uh, you do the second trimester screening in second trimester rather than going uh, uh, for the testing together uh, together at one go so uh, the sequential screening uh, usually classifies a patient into three 
three risk groups that is high risk intermediate risk and the low risk group in case of high risk group you will have to go for invasive testing and carrier typing uh, there is no doubt regarding that but in case of intermediate risk you can actually wait for the second that is a sequential testing can be done you can do a second trimester quad screening and if that is also showing abnormality you can go for an invas invasive testing and in case of low risk group there is no need for any further testing because uh, this is why uh, this is uh, done because uh, invasive testing always has got the risk of uh, preterm labor, chorioamnionitis and uh, risk of fetal loss. So that is why directly we are not going into invasive testing even if there is a chance for intermediate risk. So we will confirm with, in, with the second trimester squad screening and then proceed with the invasive testing. Now coming to the non invasive modalities of uh, diag uh, fetal diagnosis, uh, the main uh, the mainstay of uh, non invasive modality of fetal diagnosis is ultrasound. So uh, the uh, usually first ultrasound is done at around uh, eight weeks of time to see the cardiac activity and the uh, placental position and role. But uh, the scan which is important to us, us is done at around eleven to thirteen weeks of time. So in that scan, uh, basically the nuchal translucency, the nasal bone, tactus venosus tricuspid regurgitation and uterine artery doppler etc are done so it helps in dating and uh, it also helps in assessing number of fetuses and chorionicity also then uh, the second ultrasound comes at around 18 to 20 weeks scan that is a major anomaly scan so by that time you can make out structural abnormalities and do a proper cardiac scan because in the first uh, 11 to 13 weeks scan you may not completely see the heart chambers and it also depends upon the position of the fetus in the uterus also so the proper cardiac scan or cardiac anomaly scan to see the cardiac defects the outflow tracks everything can be done at a, while uh, we are doing anomaly scan at around 18 to 19 weeks time and also uterine artery doppler can also be uh, seen just to see for any uh, cardiac failure abnormalities because in that case uh, the end diastolic flow in uterine artery uh, will be reversed or it will be absent and also cervical length can also be assessed just to check for any uh, chances for any preterm delivery if there is dilatation and also shortening of length then again in third trimester also ultrasound is uh, beneficial to identify late onset anomalies because uh, sometimes in case of uh, uh, some hydrocephalus and also in case of uh, small uh, uh, MMCs it might be meningomyelocele it might be mixed in the second trimester scan but it can be picked up in the late onset anomaly and, and then the pregnancy or the delivery can be planned accordingly and also we can assess a fetal placental blood flow. So as I said earlier, uh, the nuchal translucency is a single most effective test for aneuploidy in case of imaging and more than 95th percentile is associated with chromosomal anomalies and in that case karyotyping is also indicated. But in some cases uh, the nuchal translucency will be more than 95th percentile but karyotyping will be normal. So what should we do in that case? In that case also you should follow up for structural anomalies because if nuchal translucency is high then there is always high chance for baby delivering structural anomalies at a later period also so once aerotyping if you see that it is normal you shouldn't uh, avoid uh, monit uh, monitoring the baby with uh, subsequent scans because there is always high chance for a structural anomaly and you might miss it if you are not uh, taking this thing seriously so the major structural anomalies uh, uh, anomalies which are associated with Downs include the congenital heart defects, ventricular megaly, deodorant nutrition, etc. There are also some, these are obvious anomalies which you can find in ultrasound. But in some cases, anomalies as such, it will not be there, but there will be soft markers. So soft markers are ideally not anomalies, but there are findings which suggest that this child can develop, uh, this child is uh, ideal candidate for having Down syndrome. Uh, so one includes a thickened nuchal fold, then there can be borderline ventricular megaly, absent or hyperplastic nasal bone and echo presence of echogenic bubble or presence of aberrant right subclavian artery. These are all soft markers in ultrasound. So you should have an idea about the soft markers also because directly you won't find the typical findings of uh, chromosomal anomalies in ultrasound some, in some cases. Now coming to fetal echo because <clears throat> cardiac defects are also very common. So uh, most cardiac structural anomalies can be detected prenatally and uh, adequate intervention can be done or like postnatally also we can plan such interventions based upon the uh, early identification of cardiac anomalies. So uh, main important thing is that we need to because uh, the prognosis, main prognostic thing behind the cardiac anomalies whether associated anomalies are present or not. So association with other anomalies usually affects the postnatal outcome and prenatal counseling. So this has to be identified. 
and uh, echo also has a role in the perioperative period because which a child's uh, cardiac condition can be monitored intraoperatively during fetal surgeries with perioperative echo so that is the role of perioperative echo in pain nephrology now coming to another modality that is a role of mri so mri we know that it offers a higher resolution and it is a multiplanar imaging when compared to ultrasound and it has got a large field of view the it is entirely you can see when compared to ultrasound you will be scanning uh, different parts uh, separately you will not be seeing the entire baby whole together so you will get a whole picture when you see the mri another important feature or the advantage of mri is that in case of ultrasound usually the ultrasound finding can depend upon the maternal body characteristics if the mother is extremely obese the penetration of the waves will be less so uh, there will be uh, hindrance to the visibility so uh, the report can be affected by the maternal obesity then also main important thing is fetal position if fetal position is not right you cannot examine the cardiac chambers and all properly so you might miss and you will have to wait for another scan so that is an issue and then liker quantity is also important good liker quantity is needed to get a proper ultrasound scan so all these factors are negated or it is not involved or not affecting the mri so and this is an area where mri scores over ultrasound and it doesn't have any adverse effects as of now uh, none of the studies are showing any adverse effects of mri on the fetus and uh, the main indications for fetal mri uh, according to the american college of radiology is that one is uh, congenital anomalies of the cns especially uh, the spinal cord abnormalities and also abnormalities of the uh, cranial cavity and also uh, the brain parenchyma can also be well delineated in mri when compared to ultrasound because the uh, the cranial cavity or the bone as such will be uh, will be putting shadows over the ultrasound findings so uh, mr is considered better and also skull and face abnormalities and abnormalities of the neck when we need to assess the neck masses and uh, we need to assess the airway comp uh, airway compression you can always go for an mr and also in case of other uh, pulmonary malformations like uh, congenital pulmonary airway malformations and also pelvic masses because pelvic mass uh, comes to importance when you consider the sacrococcygeal teratoma because uh, ultrasound won't be able to properly delineate the anatomy of the intrapelvic component of sacrococcygeal teratoma in that case mri will be considered better mri is considered better and also uh, to assess the complications of the monocoronic twins also in, in case of vascular to assess the vascular anatomy of the twins now coming to invasive uh, prenatal diagnosis uh, let's go through the main uh, invasive prenatal diagnosis parameters one is amniocentesis second one is chorionic venous sampling and the third one is a fetal blood sampling so indications include when you are considering uh, if a fetal aneuploidy if there is increased risk of fetal aneuploidy increased risk of a non genetic or a biochemical disease of the fetus and uh, when there is chance for maternal transmissible infections like uh, cmv rubella and toxoplasma uh, coming to amnios amniocentesis Usually, it is done at or beyond 15 weeks of age. Earlier to that, if you do it, there is high chance for fetal loss. So, it is always done in second trimester. And transabdominal aspiration is done using 22 gauge spinal needle under continuous USG guidance. And complications mainly include fetal loss. Uh, there can be post procedure rupture of the membrane, choreomyelitis, and also needle injury to fetus and maternal sepsis. Same with coronic villus sampling also, it is done between 11 to 14 weeks and it is withdrawal of the trophoblastic cells from placenta for genetic analysis. So transabdominal or a trans cervical route can be tried. It is also contraindicated in the first trimester region above, uh, 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 before 10 weeks because there is high chance for fetal loss and also limb reduction defects. Complications is almost the same, fetal loss, amniotic fluid leakage, choreomyelitis, and also vaginal bleeding risk will be also there in case of trans cervical route. Now coming to fetal blood sampling, uh, photosynthesis is mainly used for uh, taking the fetal blood sampling. It can be done for uh, therapeutic and also for diagnostic purposes. Therapeutic includes uh, intrauterine transfusion and also for drug delivery. So it is done after 18 weeks of age under USG guidance. There is a 1-2% to chance for fetal loss also. It is mainly indicated for hematological disease of hydrox and also for assessment of placental mosaicism. Now coming to uh, the non-invasive prenatal screen, uh, this is an upcoming topic that is uh, fetal DNA can be assessed or can be extracted from the maternal plasma directly because almost 10% of the cells will be fetal cells in maternal plasma and it is detectable as early as 9th week. So sensitivity is around 99.3% and specificity comes around 99.8%. 99 but the limiting factors includes uh, the cost and also chances for negative report if uh, the fetal fraction is low. 
and uh, but uh, we need to understand that it is just a screening test and confirmatory university testing is required before taking a decision regarding the management now coming to the basics of parent counseling then i will come to the specific surgical conditions so um, this uh, pain neurology and pain count pain counseling is an important uh, topic because it is not just like the normal counseling for which we do for the uh, pre operative cases uh, because uh, there are a lot of medical ethical challenges for both the obstetrician and also for the pediatric surgeon and the pain neurologist so before uh, counseling the patient we will have to always confirm the diagnosis with karyotyping and genetic analysis then only we should offer various uh, modalities to the parents the nature of the anomaly the prognosis with or without treatment the degree of morbidity and the quality of life and ex life expectancy after birth also we'll have to counsel the parents and uh, the other factors which are involved in counseling is how precious the baby is for the mother even if there is a uh, congenital anomaly if uh, if there is a possibility of continuing the pregnancy if the parents are ready to accept the risk then we respect that uh, decision and we should continue the pregnancy so this is important when the baby is very precious for the child and if they cannot if they are in a position to not conceive any more babies in the future and other parameters which we should consider especially in a country like india is financial status status, uh, status and also the access accessibility to a proper tertiary care facility with nicu and also pediatric surgery uh, facility uh, most important thing is that here we give just options to the parents and they should be the choosers they should take the final decision we shouldn't give a biased uh, counseling towards uh, for the parents we should give uh, different options and they should pick the correct options after uh, uh, informing properly the all the pros and cons of the decision and uh, most importantly if you are planning to terminate the pregnancy post termination also proper psychological support has to be given to the parents now coming to specific fetal condition we'll start off with cns abnormalities the most common cns abnormalities which we find are anencephaly encephalocele spina bifida uh, but uh, in case of large open defects in the upper vertebral levels it has got a poor prognosis usually the diagnostic modality which we use is the ultrasound and uh, this can be detected as early as anencephaly they are saying that it can be detected as early as 8th week uh, on theoretical theoretical basis but uh, usually in the 11 to 13 weeks can also you can correctly make out anencephaly so uh, in that case these are uh, severe uh, neurological defects so in that case we will have to offer termination of pregnancy and because continuing pregnancy is futile and uh, because it has got post high postnatal morbidity also and uh, but small defects like meningocele can be missed in early early ultrasound and uh, might be picked up in only uh, sometimes in second trimester or the third trimester ultrasound but uh, if if you are picking up that meningocele in that third trimester or second trimester ultrasound you will have to plan the pregnancy accordingly depending upon the size of the meningocele because if it uh, if the size increases and if it is large then you will have to uh, offer a cesarean section rather than going for a uh, uh, vaginal delivery but uh, they, they all have better prognosis with surgery now coming to sacrococcygeal teratoma uh, these are actually tumors derived from the totipotent Hansen node of primitive streak and it is a most common tumor in fetus and it, incidence is around 1 in 40,000 and females are more uh, affected the, the problem with sacrococcygeal teratoma is that there is a rapid in utero growth and uh, due to high vascularity it in turn can uh, lead to high output cardiac failure and fetal anemia this in turn leads to non-immune hydrops. Destructive processes can also occur due to the pelvic component of the tumor and it can cause hydronephrosis and also cause renal dysplasia and also cause rectovaginal fistula and also and obstetric complications uh, in the perinatal period. Until the diagnosis usually uh, uh, it is done by ultrasound. Uh, it can be picked up in 11 to 30 as early as in the 11 to 13 weeks scan but mostly it is di diagnosed in the anomaly scan which is done in 18 to 19 weeks time ultrasound finding will be a mixed solid and cystic mass often with calcification arising from the distal spine and sacral region this is a ultrasound finding showing a sacrococcygeal teratoma with both solid and cystic component the in the um, doppler mode you can see the vascularity of the tumor also So uh, another problem is that it has got an intrapelvic component mostly. So uh, intrapelvic component anatomy can be better delineated with an MRI when compared to ultrasound. So this is an area where MRI is also indicated when compared to ultrasound. And it also helps in properly assessing the local mass effects. 
the fetal anemia can be assessed uh, when there is increase in the uh, middle cerebral artery doppler peak systolic velocity and also we will have to assess with ultrasound for high features of high output cardiac failure that uh, so in fetal echo there will be increased ivc diameter and dilatation of the ventricles and increased output with uh, descending aortic uh, flow velocity can also be assessed to assess the uh, cardiac failure and um, uh, uterine artery doppler will be showing absent or reversal of flow in the end diastolic phase and there can be even vascular steel phenomenon from uterine artery to the placenta because of cardiac failure now uh, coming to the counseling of uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma uh, the counseling part uh, it has got a reasonable prognosis so uh, termination has uh, shouldn't be uh, advice so the only the particular subset of uh, patients are at greater risk especially the large tumors with the high vascular high vascularity they are at greater risk uh, but uh, if the same problem is identified in the first trimester ultrasound when there is a large tumor when there is hydrops and uh, there are features of full cardiac uh, failure uh, then we can advise uh, termination or uh, we can suggest termination for the children when it is detected in the second trimester with uh, favorable prognosis is there then we can uh, we can either provide um, um, fetal intervention or you can uh, do the surgery after birth. But you will have to closely monitor the child for si increasing size of the tumor and also uh, whether a, a cardiac failure is uh, initiated or not. So uh, a reliable annotated prediction of disease progression and survival is imperative to consult the patients. And the prognostic factors mainly involve the tumor size, vascularity and the tumor volume is to fetal weight ratio. If it is more than 0.12, it is uh, significant. The termination, as I said, termination should be discussed only in case of large vascular tumors and presence of dysplastic renal involvement and if there is a cardiovascular compromise. Coming to genital urinary abnormalities. Uh, genital urinary abnormalities is a broad spectrum. It involves uh, renal anomalies. Pelvic ureteric junction obstruction, vesicular ureteric reflex, vesicular ureteric junction obstruction, and also bladder outlet obstruction, uh, the lower urinary tract obstructions. So, mainly it involves posterior urethral valve in males, and also in females, the most common uh, anomalies will be urethral atresia, which can be a complete or partial. It is always complicated in females. And uh, the perinatal intervention or fetal intervention is only indicated for uh, lower urinary tract obstruction in male children when there is PUV. So they present with varying degrees of hydronephrosis and oligohydramnios. This will be the findings in ultrasound. And uh, usually it requires a three to four weekly ultrasound monitoring to decide the time of delivery. And uh, this, this uh, real anomalies can be detected as early as a 14 week, but mostly it is detected in the anomaly scan <clears throat> because uh, usually the, uh, the genetic urinary system starts developing by around 11 to 12 weeks and uh, the full maturity or the proper maturity happens during 20 to 30 weeks time. so if the renal damage if there is complete renal damage during that period and if it is not intervened then uh, there is no um, there is no advantage or uh, there is no uh, benefit of in you know, doing intervention in the postnatal period because by that time the maturation will be complete and if whatever damage occurs it will be permanent so early diagnosis is mandatory because it leads to a renal dysplasia and renal insufficiency which in turn can lead to pulmonary hyperplasia also this is true in case of lower urinary tract obstruction and the prognosis always depends upon the degree of the renal and pulmonary involvement mortality usually when it is diagnosed in the first and second trimester it comes around 45 percent and uh, it rises to 95 percent when there is onset of pulmonary hyperplasia and uh, mostly survivors at birth one third will end up in renal failure and they will require dialysis and eventually renal replacement therapy Coming to antenatal diagnosis, it can be detected as early as 14 weeks uh, and also sensitivity is coming up to around 95% and uh, the typical keyhole signs uh, seen in ultrasound in case of uh, lower urinary tract obstruction and there will be megacystis, enlarged bladder with this is a keyhole sign seen in ultrasound and uh, uh, you will have to see for the uh, renal echogenicity and whether renal dysplasia is present or not because it is an important prognostic factor uh, regarding deciding further treatment. So there will be increased echogenicity of renal parenchyma and there will be presence of subcortical cysts which are indicative of poor prognosis. Next thing we will have to look for is the liquor volume. The oligohydromnios if it is dictated at, uh, at around 24 weeks or above uh, that is, uh, if it is seen before 24 weeks there is high prevalence of renal dysplasia and pulmonary hyperplasia so in that cases with bilateral uh, renal dysplasias detected uh, before 24 weeks you will have to 
recommend regarding or advice regarding or counsel regarding termination of pregnancy because uh, extremely poor prognosis will be there and also uh, conditions like bilateral renal agenesis and also autosomal recessive uh, bilateral uh, polycystic kidney disease etc are the conditions where we will, you will be advising regarding termination of pregnancy rather than continuing or uh, with the pregnancy or advising any intervention during pregnancy also oligohydramnios with absence of calyctasis uh, is suggestive of severely dysplastic kidneys so these are the main findings which you will have to keep in mind while evaluating the genitourinary system then regarding counseling as i said bilateral renal agenesis uh, it is uh, termination is the only you know, um, uh, only thing which we can advise to the patients because uh, it is not amenable for any other procedures in case of unilateral region agenesis the other kid, one side kidney will be normal it has got excellent prognosis so in that case you can continue the pregnancy and in case of bilateral pelvic urethral junction obstruction also with severe oligohydramnios uh, termination of pregnancy should be advised uh, when it is found in the uh, 24th week time and in case of uh, lower urinary tract obstruction the, i'm not going into the management part as such but uh, if there are favorable prognostic factors uh, and uh, if the renal function is okay then we can always advise regarding uh, the role of vesico amniotic shunt to shunt the urine from the bladder into the amniotic cavity to relieve the back pressure and uh, damage to, and help in preventing damage to the kidneys but uh, in some studies it is shown that it only helps in preventing development of pulmonary hyperplasia and renal damage uh, and uh, doesn't really prevent that proper renal damage so uh, uh, so only intervention which is available, available now is one is vesico amniotic shunt and the other one is uh, you can do a, a fetoscopic uh, a fetal uh, cystoscopy and you can laser ablate the puv posterior valve also in case of male children now coming to limitations of the ultrasound in case of genital urinary system is that one thing is that uh, it uh, it cannot define the specific etiology and second thing is that assessment of renal function is not possible and the uh, role of fetal MR is also there for assessing the obstruction and also to assess the hydronephrosis but uh, assessing renal function uh, the available modalities are one is to do chorosynthesis and check for the beta 2 microglobulin level because fetal creatinine and fetal urea levels uh, will not be found in maternal blood because it will be filtrated by the placenta and these are small molecules which cannot cross a, cross a placenta but beta 2 microglobulin is a larger molecule which uh, uh, so it crosses the placenta and uh, uh, it and uh, beta 2 microglobulin and urine electrolyte levels can be used as an assessment for renal function of the child and it helps in uh, determining the management fetal gastrointestinal anomalies uh, mainly it involves uh, intestinal atresias so uh, it is always uh, intestinal at small bowel atresias compared to mesenteric vascular accidents and uh, uh, esophageal atresia sorry the diurnal atresias are usually due to failure of the uh, recanalization of the small uh, small bowel so most common are esophageal atresia followed by diurnal and jejunal ileal. One thing which we need to consider is that in case of uh, esophageal atresia and diurnal atresia, we will have to look for other associated anomalies. And uh, the main dictum is that higher the obstruction, earlier will be the presentation or earlier we will find the uh, or uh, find the um, typical findings suggestive of such an obstruction in ultrasound. The USG findings will be polyhydramnios and dilated power loops. And in case of small bowel atresia, mostly they are diagnosed in third trimester. And diurnal atresia, almost there is 30% chance for association with chromosomal anomalies. And uh, especially in that case, karyotyping has to be done. Then uh, early neonatal intervention decreases morbidity in all these cases. Because in all these cases, if they are found in the second trimester, uh, we can plan for uh, uh, um, term delivery and then early postnatal intervention can be done. So uh, in that case, the child should be delivered in a center, in a tertiary care center with the NIC facility and proper pediatric surgery facility so that early surgical intervention can be uh, provided to the patient. Now coming to anterior abdominal defects, uh, this includes gastrostesis, omphalocele, limb body wall complex, abnormalities. These are the most common abnormalities. Omphalocele always it is associated with other congenital anomalies and aneuploid errors. So there is high risk of antenatal mortality. And limb body wall complex and pentology of candle are lethal during antenatal life. So mostly they are, uh, what, we to, we are, what we like to consider the patients is that it has to be terminated. Proper diagnosis enables prenatal planning, amniocentesis, karyotyping and also antenatal monitoring. And helps in planned delivery in tertiary care center with access to pediatric surgery unit. Uh, early, uh, 
these defects are uh, detectable at an at a period of around 18 to 19 weeks with ultrasound scan and uh, in case of gastroschisis which is identified early you will have to terminate the pregnancy because uh, by second trimester or third trimester time uh, the child's condition will be worse but if it is uh, identified at a third in the third trimester period you can uh, continue with the pregnancy and deliver the child with cesarean section and then plan for repair but still the prognosis will be on the uh, bad side and omphalocele um, major also morbidity is high but if karyotyping is negative and if there are no associated anomalies then you can proceed with the pregnancy otherwise if associated anomalies are there you will have to counsel regarding termination coming to cardiac defects uh, cardiac anomalies are very common uh, in fetus and this can be subdivided into lethal and uh, non lethal defects uh, the mostly the lethal defects with worse prognosis includes large uh, uh, atrioventricular septal defects valvular atresia or stenosis hypoplastic ventricles and also cardiomyopathy so in the, those cases we will have to recommend regarding termination rather than going ahead with the pregnancy and creating more morbidity and mortality uh, cardiac anomalies needs a detailed evaluation and also counseling proper counseling with prognostication is important in this case and uh, uh, in case of non lethal defect proper antenatal monitoring with frequent ultrasound or fetal echo by fetal medicine expert is mandatory now coming to congenital airway malformation the fetal mainly the fetal thoracic masses includes uh, congenital pulmonary airway malformations and also bronchopulmonary sequestration when associated with high drops it is almost 100 percent fatality is there uh, main investigative modalities for the diagnosis include usg with doppler because doppler helps in identifying the feeding vessel to the uh, masses like uh, bronchopulmonary sequestration um, fetal mr is an option when with ultrasound diagnostic diagnosis is uncertain and usually it is picked up at a time period of around 18 to 19 weeks time. The congenital pulmonary airway malformation uh, volume is important in this case in case of uh, explaining prognosis that is a CVR. So uh, the, the volume is equivalent to the risk of developing hydrops. So it is an important parameter in counseling also. A CVR of more than 1.6 or dominant large cyst is more likely as uh, there in that case there is always more risk for developing hydrops and the natural cause of the disease it can either progress or mostly or one third of the cases can uh, grow to a particular size and then start regressing especially when the tumor starts uh, uh, starts outgrowing its vascular supply it uh, goes into necrosis and some and almost one third of the cases can go into a static phase also early postnatal thoracoscopic thoracosco intervention is done in the postnatal period if the child is symptomatic if at around uh, four to six months of age in case of uh, cpam so this is an ultrasound, uh, fetal ultrasound showing uh, microcystic and macrocystic uh, CCAM. Now coming to bronchopulmonary sequestration, uh, it can be extralobular or intralobular. Uh, extralobular or intralobular. The main thing with extralobular is that it can be associated with anomalies. And around 75% of the antenatal diagnosed uh, bronchopulmonary sequestration may resolve, but most likely from outgrowing their blood supply. <laughs> or it can be also due to vascular torsion of the feeding vessel. Uh, but uh, poor outcome can, can rarely occur uh, but uh, torsion leading to, and uh, there can be also torsion leading to hydrothorax and hydrops due to left to left artery venous shunting uh, termination of pregnancy is always an option if associated anomalies are present or if hydrops sets in at an early uh, period of pregnancy in case of hydropic fetus with macrocystic cecam always experiment management is futile uh, if uh, the fetal intervention can be offered when there is uh, uh, a fetal intervention can be offered in these cases and uh, main intervention is decompression of the cyst to bring back the hemodynamic stability of the uh, fetus. Now coming to uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, almost uh, two thirds of the cases are detected antenatally with uh, ultrasound and right side CDH are more difficult to detect compared to left side. In those cases you can always resort to uh, fetal MRI and indirect signs of uh, CDH includes polyhydramnios and also lower abdominal circumference. Uh, the poor prognostic factors or the poor prognosis with conventional therapy uh, is there if detected before 26 weeks and with uh, uh, and the other prognostic factors uh, which shows uh, poor prognosis one is association of, uh, with the liver herniation and also with a low uh, lung uh, head circumference uh, ratio that if it is less than one it has got poor prognosis so this uh, ratio is actually uh, taken on the no unaffected side that is on the normal lung area normal lung area is compared to the head circumference it is both are always a function of the uh, period of gestation or the 
uh, or yeah, it is it is always a function. It is compared as a function of the period of gestation of the fetus. So both USG and MRI can be done to see the volumetry and also to assess the pulmonary vascularity. And uh, superiority of MRI in this case is not yet proven. So both are equally effective. And it can be dictated as early as 11 to 13 weeks. And in that case, if it is detected, CDH is detected in the first trimester itself at around 11 to 13 weeks, there is 100% chance of proper pulmonary hypoplasia and continuing pregnancy is not indicated. So in that case, you can recommend termination of pregnancy. Uh, then in other cases which are detected late, strict antenatal monitoring has to be there and then definitely chromosomal analysis has to be done to see for, uh, uh, karyotyping has to be done to see for chromosomal anomalies and we'll have to plan the delivery near term at a good tertiary care center with adequate uh, ICU facilities. Ma management will be discussed at a later date uh, in another class. Mainly uh, the fetal surgery has a role in case of CDH. One is a FETO that is a fetoscopic uh, tracheal occlusion with the balloon because it helps in improving the pulmonary maturity. So that is the only intervention which is available and also postnatal CDH repair after stabilization of the child and also after control of pulmonary hypertension. Now, uh, summarizing the topic, uh, fetal medicine or surgery are both an evolving branch and uh, USG and MRI are the most commonly used non-invasive diagnostic modalities which are available presently. Uh, the most important thing is early detection and timely intervention is required to improve the postnatal outcome. And proper counseling of the parents are also important because of involvement of a lot of medical legal and also ethical issues. Thank you. Seto, you have done a very good job. Yes, Excellent sir. job. Thank you. Very well presented. Okay. Yes. Sir. Very well presented. Very good. I agree with uh, Ramchandra sir because uh, actually I had Univisage do to present a different way, but the way you presented, I like it because uh, two things like sir said it is a uh, comprehensively presented. Number two, more important than anything else, you have understood and conveyed the concepts, which is what I want other pages to pick up. And for a first year, you have done extraordinarily well. Extraordinarily well. I'll wait for Murli, then I will add a little more comments. Murli? Ramesh, uh, Gopal also is that. Yes, sir. I think, uh, his area yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, only, I spoke to him, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why it's particularly involved in, sir. Uh, Murli? Nothing much from his side. Okay. A few things I wanted to ask you. One yes. is you said uh, uh, interesting concept of fetal DNA in metal serum. That is a good concept because uh, from whatever you conveyed, there is some part of the fetal cells which are also circulating the placental or the metal serum metal. which can be isolated and look for the DNA. Yes, sir. My question is how are they going to segregate the, the maternal and the fetal cells? In the blood cells, even is it easy, difficult? How are they doing it, sir? Uh, what it was given in the te textbook is that uh, only it accounts for only 10 percent of the cells. So, uh, major drop, sir. Uh, in fetal intervention, they have mentioned covering the bowel. Hello, yeah, tell me, I'm listening. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, in fetal intervention, uh, I saw few words regarding uh, fetal intervention to cover the bowel uh, to prevent the exposure towards um, uh, with amniotic yeah. fluid. No, it is not possible now because bowel is completely floating in the amniotic fluid, yes, so you can't cover it. It's not like a postnatal period. Yes. What they tried was to basically antenatal intervention. They tried to remove the amniotic fluid and yes. put normal saline, no. which is less irritant. Yes. Okay, there is a there is they, in fact quite a few studies they had studied, studied where it is called amnio infusion. I mean, the, rather I don't remember what it is. They I don't remember the right word. Maybe I'm wrong. They used to take out a concept where they used to aspirate the amniotic fluid and replace it with normal saline. Yes. So that at least the irritation comes down. But the point is amniotic fluid again gets secreted over a week. It yes. required multiple multiple times for amniotic. them to do it. It actually re increases the risk. So that's a problem. Okay. Yes. So that is one. What is the concept of in utero transfer? Uh, sir, in uh, utero transfer. transfer. Uh, Anybody else? Very simple. If I tell you, you'll kick yourself. In utero transfer is a simple concept of transferring the mother to yes. a tertiary care center where the baby can be delivered. A yes. simple concept is that if the baby is within the mother's womb, it always has the best nutrition or best environment possible. Understood. Okay. Yes. Rather than delivering a baby and transferring the baby. Yes. Dr. Sudipra Sen had a brilliant cartoon. In fact, I'll see if I can hand it and put it on all the classes. It was very clear. He, in fact, he depicts a cartoon in which there are two pictures. One picture shows 
mother being a pregnant mother being carried in a bullock cart yes. and then there's one picture where uh, above there is an aeroplane going with the fetus with everything yes. there he said i just asked you used to ask a simple question tell me which which baby has got a better chance of survival the one in the bullock cart okay so because mother is always better okay that's called in utero transfer okay transfer. yes the other thing which yeah uh, other thing i wanted you to actually cover was about uh, the things which actually cause a lot of anxiety but is not of much importance in antenatally detecting which are they like echogenic cardiac focus i'll put it very clearly what is the importance of echogenic cardiac focus echogenic cardiac focus uh... anybody else no okay uh, okay the point what i was trying to tell was um echogenic cardiac focus is a very innocuous marker it's seen in many many fetuses the point is the moment they put as echogenic cardiac focus the parents get worried they think it is some heart rate problem and many of them insist on a termination you should be very very clear that a echogenic cardiac focus is just an incidental finding it has got no prognostic factor okay one yes. number two the other one because for example i have got doctor couple who has come to me for counseling with echogenic cardiac focus and a multi cystic uh, disease in one kidney sir my child has got a heart and kidney problem so i don't want the baby even after one hour of persuasion it could be difficult for them to be convinced that both of them are innocuous and not going to affect the baby but doesn't matter as rightly as you rightly said it's a parents decision so echogenic cardiac focus it should be very clear that is just a soft innocuous marker doesn't mean much yes uh, next vandana has put on the uh, chat group thank you vandana that to detect fetal dna from metal serum they do fetal hemoglobin staining thank you very much vandana i think it is it makes a lot of sense thank you people can directly talk you don't need to go through the chat group yes okay a few things i also wanted to know okay next thing you talked about cpam you have a yes, child who has got a cpam or a cpam antenatally yes sir you suggest the, uh, like you said it can have all three possibilities one it can increase and it cause high drops and other things or it can remain the same or it can disappear and become small yes sir. okay so i given a scenario because this happened to me i have got a patient who has got a uh, antenatally somebody said diaphragmatic hernia but on repeat scan it turned out to be cpam because there are multiple cysts which was mistaken to be bowel by somebody else so it was basically cpam i counseled them will wait luckily it was remained the same become little smaller at birth child was asymptomatic we have taken an x-ray it is normal so what do you do next x-ray is normal asymptomatic child antenatally detected have cpam what will you do asymptomatic child normal anybody Sir, else post postnatal imaging is showing uh, the chest x-ray is showing normal study normal normal yeah this happened to me in practice that's why i'm telling because this highlights a very important point Sir, we'll just follow up this, do we? We'll not do any interview. I know. With what? What? With what? Just clinically following up with repeat X-ray or something else? You're right. I'm not going to do anything for asymptomatic baby. But how do you follow? Okay, you're going to follow up also by means of a normal chest X-ray. Does not mean that it has disappeared completely. Yes. You require a CT scan to confirm that it is completely disappeared. Yes. So on this baby. of course the child was asymptomatic i saw the baby the parents after about 3 4 months or maybe 6 months when they are coming for a routine visit i told you how is you he said the child is normal because x ray is normal they said no you can't go by x ray did a ct scan that was definitely showing a cpam which required to be excised so what i'm saying is chest x ray alone is not sufficient to rule out a, a, a complete resolution of an antenatally detected cpam you require a ct scan of course not necessarily at birth the child is symptomatic or after a few months yes i hope i made the point clear understood okay uh robert anything i am um, robert ala gopal anything that you want to say because there is something more i would need to summarize gopal murli ramchandra sir uh, i just wanted to ask uh, uh, seto yes sir yes sir uh, when you come across certain conditions uh, you always have the, at the back of your mind that uh, if this child was delivered little early maybe the chances were better yes sir so what are those conditions where you can plan and, and deliver the child sure. and deliver the child early yes sir uh, uh, with an obstetrician yes sir sir uh, a better prognosis for the child 
Yes, sir. Uh, those conditions. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, preterm, uh, preterm induced labor is indicated in certain conditions. Like uh, if uh, the third trimester scan is showing progression, progression of hydrocephalus, if it has detected earlier, if it is progressing, or if there are signs of any high drops developing, those are main indications for inducing a, a preterm labor. So you have to balance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any other condition? Mm, sir, uh, there are two, three conditions. Sir, so ruptured. Can, uh, yes, sir. Sir, in case of yeah. uh, ruptured MMC also, myelomeningocele uh, myelom also, we can consider uh, early delivery. Okay, I will never come across, okay, no? I will, uh, I will accept. Yes, sir, please, I will, I will sir. enumerate the conditions. Yes, sir. I will enumerate the conditions. post valve is one common condition where you can uh, counsel the parents and you can uh, um, plan with the obstetrician for a early planned. Early planned means maybe around 36 weeks or so. So, uh, you get... Four weeks of uh, postnatal life where you can decompress the bladder. Yes. Okay? Yes, sir. 36 weeks is generally when it is uh, ideal to do a postural tulal after consultation with the obstetrician. So, most often these are cesarean deliveries. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. So, the babies are steroided and the baby is got to you four weeks above before term. So, the, the so four more weeks of time you get where there is unobstructed. Uh, system you can immediately put a catheter and you can take care of the baby by vesicostomy or whatever means okay important yes. thing is you have to have a good biophysical profile and you have to make sure that the weight is good and you have to make sure that the pulmonary maturity is taken care of okay yes. Yes. similarly in um, sacrococcygeal teratoma it can be with hydrops or without hydrops but hydrops is bad but yes. generally sacrococcygeal teratoma you can go for a early yes. planned delivery yes Similarly, for some people say in many centers, they have done studies and found that uh, lumbosacral myelomeningocele, if uh, uh, it is uh, planned delivery is done at around 36, 36 weeks with all factors considered and the delivery is by cesarean section, the chances of neurological uh, uh, damage to the baby is much less compared to uh, delivering by normal uh, that is uh, vaginal road. Yes. Okay. Yes. Other one and is uh, diaphragmatic yeah. hernia. Diaphragmatic yes. hernia and uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, lung anomalies. But generally, diaphragmatic hernia, you can go for a planned early uh, delivery of the baby. Okay. Yes. Other condition I would add is gastroscosis. Okay. You can yeah, even plan for that. Correct. Correct. Okay. Gastroscosis also. Yeah. And in all these cases, what is most important, Setu, is that you have to balance out the Premature. problems of prematurity as compared to this. Yes, sir. Because not everybody is endowed to have a good obstetrician. Ramchandra yes, sir is very fortunate because Mangala Madam is there. Because most of the obstetricians I work with are many times, they are very senseless. Many times. For example, I had a patient with a PU years, defected at 30 weeks, family of doctors, mother is a gynecologist, grandmother is a gynecologist. This is a radiologist from Hyderabad. Ramurthy sir had seen. And he had sent the patient for counseling. 32 weeks, a PU was, uh, mother says they want to deliver the baby. I said, 32 weeks is no point because you're going to be fighting with the nature mm -hmm. for uh, preterm delivery, preterm related issues. I said, let's not do it at 32 weeks, let's do it at 36 weeks. Parents came back. He said, no, sir, my grandmother says, no, no, you have to deliver soon. I said, you are going to. That is the time I had to actually put this case in uh, the International Epidemic Urology Group and almost the entire consensus, like what Dr. Ramses was saying, is the benefit of delivering a baby too soon is not too much. But definitely a little early, yes, but not too much. You need to balance out with like what Ramchara said, said was about the biophysical profile, about your NAC backup, about how things are, and in consultation not with the gynecologist, but also with the neonatologist and then handle it. Okay? Yes. So that is one. So what I was generally asking you was, if you I mean, I was trying to get, I couldn't get that uh, Michael Arison's book. There's yes, some developing yes. human. It is a fantastic book, Embryological Basis for Congenital Malformations by Michael Harrison. We have it, but it's in the department library. Unfortunately, we lost the key. Transition between Shu and Vinay and back somewhere. Anyway, that is actually a beautiful diagram which says about three things. One, when you make a diagnosis, first you assess the complete profile. Then you say, is the child going to may have a good quality of life or is it going to be lethal to the child or to the mother? Then you have to plan for termination. Number two, is the child going to benefit from early intervention? That is, like Sir said, if you deliver the baby, if you're going to get extra few weeks uh, of, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, recovery, uh, so that, for example, developing kidney, 
or a developing lung is going to have a problem or a teratoma yes these are the cases you will plan for a section early four patients were to be delivered as much close to term as possible most of the conditions are necessary where you have to deliver as close to term as possible then the decision has to be made whether it is going to be whether it is going to be a cesarean section or a normal delivery cesarean section is indicated basically in cases where you expect a dystocia yes or delivery problems or mental yes. factors unfortunately many obstetricians i have seen have a tendency any and only they will deliver a uh, section i have had patients with antenatal unilateral hydronephrosis being delivered by section saying no 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 child has got anomaly so we will not take a chance not necessary i think you need to uh, sit and counsel them or discuss about anomalies with them before taking a decision i think these are the main things that you have to keep yes That's very important that you said is whenever there is an antenatal counseling required first thing is make sure that who has done the scan discuss with him if necessary secondary repeat an ultrasound scan because all the information that is necessary is very important and Absolutely. currently with the medical uh, termination right now it, uh, currently it is about 20 weeks there is a move to make it to 24 weeks yes sir but unfor- but unfortunately it is still not come to practice so by the time the anomaly scan is made at 20 weeks by the time they decide and seek your counseling it's already 21 or 22 already. weeks yes. and you don't have much time so best time to do a scan is 18 weeks 18 weeks because whatever said in parents are going to be difficult so you need to spend a lot of time with both the parents that is both the mother and the father give them the options like you said in a non judgmental manner not sitting on an ivory tower answer all their questions as honestly as possible including cost implications delivery implications where to do what all the things and then let them take the final call yes sometimes it is necessary that they are so anxious that they can't make a decision that i have told them to come next day or next day afterwards after we sitting at home discussing and coming back in fact it is this touch of humanity which is going to make a difference that you are going to help them to take the right decision all right yes gopal sir. gopal yeah uh, yeah can i can you hear me yes sir. yes yes please yeah i mean yeah very wonderful uh, lecture and if this is really a first year boy who has done this uh, he has done a great job i mean Thanks. so like uh, yeah michael harrison i remember was a favorite book during our mch days ramesh if you remember uh, yes was, yes uh, very nice yeah. basically uh, i do a lot of these counselings and uh, i have a non deserved and uh, irritating reputation of being an expert in this town uh but it helps in a certain way because it helps you to give a certain kind of uh, exposure of the uh, pediatric surgeons uh what is happening is lot of uh, a few thoughts really because there's nothing really to add to the theoretical aspects of what your uh, student has said you see first thing is uh, a lot of uh, th- there's a difference between structural anomalies and genetic anomalies and a lot of references you're going to get from the obstetricians are for counseling of uh, uh, the soft marker anomaly the soft markers are a distinct group of uh, uh, structural uh, kind of uh, abnormalities detected on ultrasound something like uh, are you with me are you yes, with sir. Me? yes yes yeah yeah so things like uh, ecogenic foci in the left ventricle mild uh, ventricular dilatation bilateral hydronephrosis that's that's been gone now a depressed nasal bridge you know and stuff like that because these are all basically they are markers they are markers and a single umbilical artery single umbilical artery single umbilical yes. artery yeah, these are kind of markers which kind of mandate further testing in forms of uh, the most definitive test you have is actually a amniocentesis and genetic analysis yes sir so genetic analysis is something which uh, we should be very clear about and we should be very clear about of all the soft markers because you are not managing the pregnancy from the beginning it's a gynecologist who does it who is an obstetrician and believe me most of the obstetricians have no clue about uh, all these so even the most senior obstetricians will kind of they don't have the time so they kind of everything they'll dump on somebody who is showing some interest in counseling uh, these babies a lot of your work like uh, i i do a lot of antenatal counseling and uh, a majority of the work is kind of handling the genetic problems and not with the structural problems and then for this you have to be in close association with a geneticist a medical geneticist uh, a fetal medicine specialist and these are the people who you should be constantly talking to because a lot of this uh, uh, genetic a lot of things have come in genetics like uh, fish analysis uh microarray analysis 
uh, how do you kind of uh, screen for the next uh, pregnancy what samples you take the role of fetal autopsy so these are the kinds of thing you kind of uh, counsel the parents so that is very important second is like uh, as ramesh sir has said the 20 weeks limit is a big big irritating factor here and it's a big limiting factor because most of the patients when they come to you for counseling they are they have crossed 20 weeks yes so like they kind of uh, the majority of the patients who come to me like will be in the range of 19 to 23 weeks so and it becomes very difficult kind of to kind of uh, and and at the age of 20 weeks 22 weeks you don't do a, a, a you, know, you don't do a, a double marker and a quadruple marker and and when when the radiologist puts it in bold letters at 22 weeks that this child has got a, a echogenic foci in the left ventricle and requires quadruple marker and the gynecologist believes it it is you're dealing with absolute stupidity from all sides yes. because you should know when the markers are done what is the period when you're actually doing it and what is the role of the mark they are all screening tests yes screening tests they actually they have to be always confirmed with amniocentesis or cvs with a genetic analysis and and it is very disturbing to a certain extent because uh, uh, we are almost approaching a kind of a hunt and eliminate uh, strategy for down syndrome we are not allowing any down syndrome actually to be born so, which is again a very big ethical issue. We'll, we'll not go into all that. So, that is one thing. Second is like, uh, uh, as uh, practitioners, when I mean, you're going to go into peripheries, do not get too attached to prenatal surgery because that is, we are far, far beyond, behind uh, in terms of achieving any respectable uh, infant mortality rate and neonatal mortality rate, which is huge in our country. And uh, the role of prenatal interventions come when your NMR is in single digit. And we are far, far, far behind that. So don't get too kind of, it's very attractive, glamorous. And one of the reasons I joined pediatric surgery because I thought I could do fetal surgery at some point of my life. But I think fetal surgery is something which is excessively glamorized. And it probably has a very small role to play as a practicing pediatric surgeon. Uh, perhaps except in very 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 tertiary centers i think uh, advising the mother for uh, preconception folic acid prophylaxis uh, uh, good say sane advice uh, regarding prognosis and uh, and i think you should uh, be more keen on preserving the fetuses because a lot of these anomalies they get uh, terminated because of very wrongful advice from radiologists, gynecologists, pediat pediatricians are not at all interested, let me tell you, because they are not at all keen in this field. It is only left to us. So we have an additional responsibility to learn more about genetic problems. And of course, there are a lot of ethical dilemmas, uh, especially when you're dealing with bad conditions, late pregnancy, beyond 24 weeks, what do you do with them? And uh, I think, uh, but this is a good uh, way of uh, kind of uh, establishing your practice. And I think it helps in gaining a certain amount of reputation. Thank you. Thank you, sir.